Hello there. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to reprise a talk I originally gave as part of a fashion show in February at Locust Grove in Louisville, Kentucky. The title of my talk is actually a play on the title of a work by Jane Austen called A History of England by a Partial Prejudice and Ignorant Historian, which she wrote in 1791, uh, and she was only 15 when she wrote it. Her sister Cassandra actually painted the miniatures that illustrate the work, including this one to the left, uh, which is Queen Elizabeth I. There are a couple other women in who have miniatures in the work, including Mary I, Queen Mary, and also Mary Queen of Scots. The clothing and all the miniatures is contemporary to the Austin girls, Jane and Cassandra. It's all late, late 18th century, or at least 18th century. So the majority of movie and stage adaptations, as, as Jane Austen fans know, of her novels actually portray women characters usually in the Regency era costumes with the really high waistlines and the really columnar skirts. And this year's theme for the Jane Austen Society of North America is Jane's Juvenilia, all of which she wrote as a teenager in the late 18th century. And it's only been published relatively recently. Um, so because of this, and because I only ventured into 18th century costuming last year, I thought it would be, fun, would be fun to actually share what I have learned. And I got started in this era. I used to only do Regency costuming because I love Jane Austen and I love her novels and I thought that's all I would do. And then I joined some groups on social media and eventually started meeting up with these wonderful people in person. And members of the St. Louis Georgians, now known as the St. Louis Historical Sewing Society, are in this picture to the right. And I really credit these ladies with encouraging me and inspiring me to jump into 18th century costume. I've only made three gowns and all of them were made basically so that I could go to events that are themed around the 18th century. And uh, the other group that I joined was the Indiana Historical Costuming Society. And members of this group actually came to the Jane Austen meeting with me and were models, basically in a little fashion show uh, that went with my talk. And you'll see pictures of them throughout this presentation. But in this picture, you might recognize some of these uh, fabulous costumers particularly on the right, that is Christine. She's the leader of our St. Louis group. And she's also known as Sosteen on Instagram, YouTube, and she has a blog. Um, and she's just a wonderful costumer. And you can see that she's in this Francais gown in this picture. All right, so this talk is kind of partial and prejudiced <laughs> because it's all about women's fashion. I did not really go into men's fashion in here and I don't touch on everything or else we would be here for hours and hours and hours and hours. That could be fun, but I just wanted to share with the Jane Austen group what I have learned in less than a year, at least at that point when I gave the talk in February, of studying this stuff and trying to make these costumes. So I'll link a more extensive discussion of these styles um, that you can find on Dame Zella Mode's YouTube channel in the description box below. We are going to start with um, the French connection. So most of my sources for this talk are primary sources in the form of portraits, fashion plates, and extant garments. But I also use plenty of secondary sources that I'll share with you as we go along and also have a list of them in the discussion box and picture of the pictures of the book covers at the end. I also looked at many dress blogs and historical costumers, Instagram posts and things like that, which helped to solidify some of this knowledge. And I don't even remember all of them um, that I looked at. So I'll just share with you um, the books, which are easily accessible and that you can get to. But at the time of Jane Austen's birth, and if you don't know when she was born, it, it was when this painting of Marie Antoinette 
was apparently made in 1775. But at that time, you know, the American Revolution was, was burgeoning and Rococo excess was all the rage in European courts in terms of architecture and art, which translated into magnificent fashions, which are like those epitomized by uh, those worn by queens and these two portraits. So Marie Antoinette was really a fashion trendsetter at this time. And French fashion in general just permeated the continent, even England, <laughs> despite those countries' political differences. So in these two official portraits, we can see the sumptuous and elaborate detail of the Rococo period. Uh, in the magnificence of the queen's gowns, you see the wide skirts supported by pannier, panniers or panniers, um, elaborate sleeve flounces on Charlotte's gown, the decorative chemise sleeves of Marie Antoinette's gown, the stomacher fronts, the luscious and varied trim, the lace, the bows, and the structured hair with poofs. So this is the period in which Jane was born and the gentry, which is the class that she belonged to, would have worn much more muted versions of these styles, but you could still see elements of them there. How did they get these shapes? Okay, so if you notice in the portraits, there are very particular conical torso shapes and of course the um, very wide skirt. So how did they get these? Well, it's all about under things with most historical costuming and honestly into, you know, today. The under things will create the base layer, the, the under shape that then gives structure to that beautiful dress that, that goes over top of it. And so you'd have a shift or a chemise and over that women wore stays, which you might think of as a corset, um, but in the 18th century, they were called stays and also various types of skirt supports. And going into the 1770s, the skirts, like I said, were really wide at the hips um, and they were held up by pocket hoops or panniers. And some court gowns had panniers that were as wide as the wearer was tall, uh, but the gentry, of course, would have worn much tamer versions. I'll let you look at these stays here. Okay, so stays were often heavily boned, meaning that there really isn't that much area um, of the stays that did not have some sort of either whale baleen or reed um, for structure. And this boning helped create the conical shaped torso. Uh, and these are a particularly lovely pair at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So some were back lacing, some were front lacing, and some were even both front and back lacing. And I have to say the stays that lace in the front are much easier for me to get in and out of. And while these red beauties appear to be laced in the front, that is actually false lacing. And here you can see another example of the, um, the side hoops to give that shape. Then when we move into the 1780s, we see a change from the emphasis on width of the hips to accentuating the shape of basically the derriere <laughs> through the use of various false rump skirt supports. You could make yours a solid mass or you could use a split bum version. I made the split rump in the lower right using the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking, a book that I highly recommend if you're interested in uh, this kind of costuming. And the bum pad at the top from the American Duchess Simplicity pattern uh, based on Outlander patterns. So non-costumer significant others of costumers today could be quite flummoxed when asked if such things make their costumer loved ones but look big. <laughs> because of course the answer should be a resounding yes, but our modern sensibilities and view of body shapes might cause some hesitation in answering that question. The false rumps could be filled with ground cork, so save those wine bottle corks, or feather down. I actually filled mine with polyester fill, which makes me cringe, but I plan to use them for a long time. So these satirical cartoons on this slide uh, definitely exaggerate the actual size of the supports, 
But when you have them on, they certainly can feel this big. You have to readjust your sense of personal space or you'll end up knocking things off tables like I have or just knocking into walls. All right, and then we get to um, the pet and lar or the pet and lair, pet on lair, something like that. Also, uh, which I have read actually translates to fart in the wind. And these are such cute little jackets that go over very often adorable petticoats. So why would they, why would they be called fart in the wind, basically? Um, LACMA here stands for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. The story goes uh, that Madame de Pompadour, chief mistress of Louis XV and fashion trendsetter earlier in the century, supposedly named this type of jacket after one of her friends, had one on and passed wind. So this story could be apocryphal, uh, but it's certainly entertaining nonetheless. And the short, it's basically a short version of a sack back gown or a robe à la française in French with pleats reaching to the floor and beyond in an elegant train. So this is just like a shortened version of that. And the pet would have been worn at home and in formal occasions, although many are actually absolutely gorgeous, very highly decorated, like these embroidered and trim versions in gorgeous silks. So perhaps they were salvaged from a sack back gown with damage to the long skirt, I don't know, but um, fabric was really expensive, much more so than labor. I'd love to study some of these and see if they have evidence of, um, you know, being part of a larger garment at one time. And here I am in a pet, in, pet on lair. I'll say it right one of these days. Um, but my version is one that I completed this winter and I, I basically completed it for the fashion show that this talk went with. My friend, Sostein or Christine, began this jacket a few years ago and we're good friends and we're kind of close to the same size. So when she decided she didn't feel like finishing it, and if you look at her Instagram and her, her YouTube and everything, it's very clear she's gone on to do extremely beautiful things. Um, but she decided to give it to me to finish and wear. So thank you so much, Christine, for being a pet on there enabler. So I added the trim uh, and the sleeve ruffles to the jacket and I made the stomacher and the petticoat. And I basically, if you can't tell, <laughs> I wanted to practice a bunch of different types of 18th century trim. And so this outfit, this outfit has a lot of them. It has box pleats, it has ruching, it has puff trim, and it has the big gauze, gauzy ruffle flouncy thing uh, at the bottom. And it really does flounce. I love walking around in the wind. Uh, because it, it moves a lot more than the, the slightly stiffer silk. So the pet on, on there and sack back gowns were popular earlier. Then when we move into the 1770s, 1780s, we get all sorts of different cute jackets. We have the Carico, like the one in the bottom right. We have jackets that um, have bodices that are cut in one or with separate peplums. And those peplums could be really short, like the one on the, the left here, or they could be a little bit longer. They could have no trim or they could be quite roughly and elaborate. There's so much variety in jackets. If you Google 18th century uh, fashion plates, you come up with so many hits. Also in the various books that I'm gonna talk about, there are extant jackets that have had patterns made from them that you can actually blow up and then um, try out yourself, which is really cool. So in this next slide, I have one of my friends who was at the fashion show and her name is Sandy. She's at Rosehip Cosplay on Instagram and she is wearing a version of an extant jacket, the one on the left, and hers is made of cotton sateen. I love this green color, hashtag green bias. She hand stamped the gold spots and you can also see the piping that's in gold. 
And the separate vest and lapels are silk taffeta, again, hand printed with spots. <laughs> it's so cute. The look itself is, is menswear inspired writing style, featuring a cropped cutaway vest or jacket, I'm sorry, vest and men's style shirt over uh, a plain skirt. And in typical 1790s style, you can see the influences of 18th century and the conical torso shape and overall styling merging with the narrower, rounder skirts uh, and higher waists of typical Regency styles that we'll see a bit later. Moving on to the Italian gowns, also known as the quarterback gowns. Okay, so beginning in the 1780s, a newish style of fitted back gown became more prevalent than the earlier English gown. So the English gown has pleats at the back that are all in one with the skirt. And this gown does not. The skirt and the, the bodice are separate. And <clears throat> instead of pleats at the back, you have seams, either in four pieces or in two, usually. And uh, there are several variants of the Italian gown, what we modernly call a zone front or cutaway gown, a chemise front. They had various sleeve lengths, including long sleeves, three quarter length sleeves, and the sleeves could be trimmed, uh, untrimmed, etc. So there's lots of variety. But the defining factor seems to be the, the separate bodice and, and also those back seams. And this is a, a an example of this from the Dar Museum, Daughters of the American Revolution, and their Agreeable Tyrant exhibition, which happened in 2016, 2017. I actually got to see this gown in person. It was really cool, but I was still thinking, nope, just Regency at that point in time. It took Christine and some other friends uh, to really get me into this 18th century stuff. And when I did, I got Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion One, um, and so here you can see another example really clearly how the bodice is separate from the skirt. Okay, so here I am on the left and my friend Erin is on the right. She's at Gracie's Fancy on Instagram. And we have both made Italian gowns. I've actually made two. This is my first one that I recently fixed because there were a lot of fitting issues because I didn't know what I was doing. It was my first 18th century outfit ever and I could not figure out how to fit it on myself. Well, since then I've learned quite a bit and so I completely redid it and now it fits much, much better. But here we are in, in our gowns and you'll notice that both of them are printed cottons. Okay. Um, so Erin actually got her fabric from Ikea a while ago. I don't know if they have it anymore, but they've actually been producing bed linens and other fabrics in an array of 18th century looking patterns. I mean, some of them are really close to historical prints. It's really cool. I have now bought, I mean, mine is not an Ikea fabric, this gown in particular, but I have bought uh, several sets of duvet covers uh, that I plan on turning into gowns. But we both made our gowns heavily using the aforementioned uh, American Duchess book. And while Erin's gown and petticoat are the same fabric, if you go back to that first slide, um, she originally made it to go uh, over a brown petticoat. Uh, and then after that, she made one, a petticoat with the same fabric. And this one that has the matching petticoat looks a lot like the one in the, the previous slide from the DAR Museum. But you could also make petticoats, like I said, in a contrasting fabric, which I've done here. This is a very useful fashion possibility, fashion choice, especially when you've run out of your gown fabric. I did not have quite enough left of this print to actually make a matching petticoat. But note that the bodice meets in the front rather than requiring a separate stomacher. Uh, that's evidence of a shift from earlier in the 18th century. Also, notice that both Erin and I have ruffled tuckers and, and sleeve ruffles made with fine cottons. We also got the pattern or the directions to do this from the American Duchess book. And wearing a neck tucker or a fichu was a must for most 18th century women. 
there is some overlap. It seems like there's a Venn diagram of Italian gowns and English gowns and different museums, different historical costumers and different fashion historians seem to label these somewhat differently or interchangeably. And I'm not sure why, um, but there's, these labels are sometimes confusing because we can't go back and actually listen to 18th century people talk about these various styles and hear what they called them. Um, the English gown probably would have just been a, called a gown or maybe a nightgown uh, in England. And gown is pretty generic. So if they use that for everything, then of course there's gonna be overlap. But uh, so are these English gowns or Italian gowns? This extant example, the Met, and others have labeled as an English gown, while various costumers um, have called it an Italian gown. Maybe it's due to provenance more so than uh, the actual style, you know, of how the bodice and the skirt connect. But uh, at the very least, it seems clear <laughs> that humans love and, and almost have to, to make sense of the world label things and when criteria for classification get fuzzy we get frustrated or at least i do the gown appears to have a separate bodice and skirt like in the fashion plate so i would i would label it an italian gown but it's it's probably from england so then yeah maybe we could just call it an english whatever <laughs> whatever either way it is from the 1780s and it's gorgeous. And my friend Christine, or at So Seen, made a splendid black and white version of this extant gown. And I encourage you to go see it on her blog or on Instagram. Ah. And here's my friend Victoria. The Met also calls the gown in this portrait an English gown. And my friend uh, at History on a Budget on Instagram recreated it beautifully. So the gown itself has a cutaway bodice and the cutaway is white, like the petticoat. Cutaway, cutaways could also be made with the same fabric as the rest of the gown, like the striped gown in the previous slide. And then we get to redding goats. The word redding goat is believed to come from the French, French pronunciation of riding coat and you can see the resemblance to men's coats in these two lovely extant examples. They were women's long coats, sometimes short later on uh, or early on actually, and sometimes with a cutaway or contrasting fronts and could be very practical garments made of wool uh, or elaborately decorated silks like the one on the right. Actually both of these are made of silk. Basically there was a huge variety uh, in redding goats. So a very fashionable and versatile gown in the 1780s into the 1790s. And like I said, it could be made of silk, wool, it could be made of cotton. Um, you could have long sleeves like here or three quarter length sleeves, usually prominent collars. Uh, they were often double breasted. The buttons or closures came in a variety um, of styles, huge buttons like the one on the left things like that. And again, my friend Christine, who is clearly my costuming hero, recreated the red and goat on the right with her fantastical embroidery skills. And I definitely need to make one myself. It won't be as fantastical as Christine's, but there are so many possibilities for red and goats, as you can see in this, this multitude of fashion plates from the 80s and the 90s. And these are just a few of my favorites, and I plan on making at least one of these. I already have some wool, so now I need to decide on the style. And I'm really leaning towards the blue one with the matching blue petticoat and the striped waistcoat. Note the wonderful variety of hats as well. Oh my goodness. You have relatively dainty, but still pretty crazy looking hats. And then up here in the upper right, it is, wider than her shoulders. It almost looks wider than her hips. And look at that crazy bow on the front. Okay, so lots of cool hats happening at the same time that you could wear with your redding goats. And oh, we are not done with them yet. Here are two that are in portraits. And there are actually so many portraits of these, but I chose these two because they're both black. 
but they show uh, a little bit of variety, even though the redding goats themselves are the same color. So you've got a difference in skirt placement, whether it almost closes in the front or is set back farther along the waist, kind of like an Italian gown. You can see the different uses of cravats at the neck, definitely inspired by men's fashion. And we have differences in button placement. There's piping in the one on the right, and oh my goodness, the hats. Also, I feel the urge to go down a research rabbit hole on children's clothing during this time period because this kid looks like he or she, I don't know, is in itchy long red underwear. What, what is going on with that? Anyway, all right, moving on. Another popular style of this time is sometimes called the chemise a la reine. Uh, oops, sorry. But which means um, chemise of the queen. And this scandals fashion, because it kind of looks like underwear of the 1780s, was the robe and chemise, chemise a la reine, uh, chemise de Gaulle, basically a gowns inspired by the underwear of the lower classes. Robes and chemise feature gathered bodices, sometimes cut in one with the skirt, and extant examples are often literally tubes of fabric gathered in strategic places with the sleeves attached. There are various stylings. Some have fitted backs while others have gathered backs. Some have full billowing sleeves while others have long tight sleeves. Chemise gowns were made of lightweight fabrics in any color, not just white, often cotton, sometimes silk. Here you can see my friend Hannah or at Fabric and Fiction in her version of the gown uh, with a false rump and lovely sash, very much like the portrait on the right. So I have this style of gown on my list of things to make this year as well. Yes, the list is very long. Here we have more portraits of ladies in their chemise, uh, robe de robe chemise, or however you would say it in French, also known as the chemise de Gaulle. This portrait in the middle is of, of course, Marie Antoinette. And it was put on display at the Louvre in Paris uh, at the Salon, where everyone could, would basically be able to come and view it. And the painting really angered the public, apparently, and was quickly removed. And Elizabeth de Brun, who painted this one, painted another one of the queen in an identical posture in a more proper gown. In other words, not something that looked a heck of a lot like underwear. So Marie's reputation suffered apparently because she was seen as breaking down barriers between the classes by wearing the dress basically of a shepherdess or a farmer's daughter. She was trying to create the pastoral aesthetic of her home, Petit Trianon, uh, which was her escape from the Palace of Versailles. And she did succeed in spurring this fashion trend. Way to go, Marie. Despite the resemblance to underwear, all of these women would have worn the gowns over stays, petticoats, and often skirt supports. And then we get to the 1790s round gown. It looks a lot like the natural progression of the chemise dress with various types of bodices that all have the high waistline of later gowns, typically um, associated with the Regency period. The full skirts have no obvious skirt supports, probably just lots of gathering in the fabric, maybe a couple of petticoats, and perhaps a tiny bum roll at the back to encourage fullness. But these gowns definitely anticipate the austerity of the neoclassical styles in the early 1800s. And my friend Greta here is wearing one with a lovely sash to emphasize the high waist. Here are a few of my favorite extant examples of round gowns. Now I have visited the one in the center at the Dar Museum in DC in 2016 at the Agreeable Tyrant exhibition. Okay, so the gowns were often white, but definitely not always. And just look at these gorgeous colors and the elaborate trims and patterns, the stripes in the one at the left. Okay. I was riveted by that one in the middle. I, I want to recreate it at some point. I've since made two round gowns, one white and one with an aqua sari. 
and I would love to create each of these. Okay, so this is a late 1798 fashion plate on the left from Costume Parisien that my friend M recreated and wore in the fashion show at Locust Grove in February. The description of the fashion plate says, quote, hairstyle a la Titus, shawl pinned over the shoulder, coat carried over the arm, and gathered gloves, end quote. And I think she did a great job with this uh, recreation. This is very, a very obvious adaptation of classical Roman style with a hairstyle directly lifted from imperial Roman sculpture and a toga-like wrap worn over the dress. Even the ribbon-laced shoes in the fashion plate are a callback to ancient styles. And my final model is my friend Eleanor or Swellenora on Instagram who made an 1802 gown inspired by this fashion plate in Ladies Monthly Magazine. So the waistline is firmly under the bust by this time and would be for about the next two decades. The sash, the columnar skirts, the floral decor, and even the hair are all neoclassically inspired. And one can naturally see how these Greek and Roman sculpturesque lines influence all the Regency fashions we see in movie adaptations of Jane's novels. I think she did such a great job. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I want to leave you with a bit of a head to toe impression of the changes that took place, or at least that I've learned about uh, in the late 18th century. And we'll start with the shoes. Yes, shoes. Normally, my friends and I get shoe circle photos at each event we attend, but I was so busy presenting and then talking with audience members that I forgot to get one at the fashion show. I, in fact, did not get any of uh, the photos at the fashion show and had to rely on other people. So thank you, everyone who contributed your photos. But no matter, here's a shot of Aaron and Greta and I showing off our shoes at the request of someone in the audience. They are all reproduction shoes from American Duchess, and I think other members of the, the modeling team also had AD shoes. So extant historical shoes are absolutely fascinating, and I love this picture of shoes from the Agreeable, Agreeable Tyrant exhibition, showing changes in the heel height from the 1780s at the top to the 1820s at the bottom. One audience member asked if, some of us were being quite improper ladies by having short petticoats that showed off our shoes and even our ankles. And the answer is no. This was the style in the 1770s and 1780s, which is why I didn't even need to lift my skirts at all to show off my shoes, while Greta wearing 1790s uh, round gown does have to. And I can't end without at least mentioning what was going on with hair in the last quarter of the 18th century. So hair in the 1770s, oh my. There was actually quite a bit of variety. The huge heights, the extreme heights in hair that you see depicted in this fashion plate and then kind of made fun of in the satirical cartoon were not, not the norm for the entirety of that decade. Um, it was a relatively short number of years, but it could be achieved, and it was actually achieved, um, by using hair cushions of various sizes and shapes, lots of pomatum and powder to create long-lasting structure, buckle curls, and properly sturdy foundations for the poofs and other head decor that allowed the wearer to reach even greater heights. So this height was only popular, like I said, for a brief time in the 1770s, and we can all blame or applaud Marie Antoinette for that, I think. Let's look at some portraits of Queen Charlotte, Queen of England, in order to talk about these big changes that happened in hairstyles. Again, the talk by uh, Dames a la Mode which I'll link down below, also goes over this in a bit more detail. So in, in her 1777 portrait, we see that her hair is very high. It has a smooth appearance, lots of pomatum and powder, uh, lots of hair decor. Well, it's up there at the top and it's likely ribbons. It looks like beads and probably some pearls. 
I mean, Queen Charlotte absolutely adored pearls, um, so they're likely pearls. Then we move on to her 1789 portrait, and you can see that the the uh, dimensions of the hair have changed drastically, as well as the texture. We get more width in the hair and not as much height. She's still likely using hair cushions, they're just a different shape, and the hair looks a bit more frizzy or uh, there's just more teasing almost, um, definitely more texture. And then we go to 1793. And Queen Charlotte's hair is covered by her bonnet and her veil, which would not be easy with the earlier hairstyles. Instead, you'd have a hat that would perch on top of the structure. In 1793, her hair is much less structured, much uh, more smushable, um, and gone were the big hair cushions. And with the taxing of hair powder, people were using less of both it and pomadum. I think her hair in the 1793 portrait looks much more like it does uh, in typical styles of the Regency period. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here because again, Taylor at Dames Alain Mode goes into lots of great detail. And I actually have an entirely other video of a talk I did in 2015 on uh, changes in jewelry and their social importance and implications, mostly related to Jane Austen's novels. So the jewelry, uh, the very few times it's mentioned in Jane Austen novels, I turn into an entire 40 minute talk, of course. But I do wanna show you some of the contrast, just a very brief one between jewelry before and after the French Revolution. Note that the opulence of these items on this slide, including a repl replica of the infamous diamond necklace that deepened the social strife in France. Uh, now let's look at some interesting pieces from during and after the French Revolution. Okay. So like uh, the monarchy that supported it, the extravagant mode of ornamentation exemplified by the diamond necklace uh, that Marie Antoinette was uh, unwillingly involved with was superseded for a time, at least a time, by jewelry with greater simplicity and symmetry and composition, the neoclassical style. A French case in point is the, is the uh, um, pair of guillotine earrings on the right here from France, from Paris, manufactured during the Reign of Terror uh, in the image on the right. And in the image on the left, you can see classically themed busts in a cast glass cabochon marking the upsurge of another classical revival. And this time with significant focus on Greco-Roman imagery in miniature. And I just think this is fascinating. The juxtaposition of the violence inherent in an instrument of execution and the serene, logical Romanesque faces is striking and emblematic of the shockingly swift changes in all manner of life during this period. Okay, before I say goodbye, for now, my dear friends, I'd like to point out the odd costumes in the recent adaptation for TV of Austin's very slim fragment of a novel, Sanditon. I ended up watching this entirely for the costumes uh, pretty much during the first episode, in part because the producers blew through Austin's original material before that first episode was even over. <laughs> It appeared to me as though Lady Denham here was also trying to present changes in fashion over the course of several decades. She mostly appears stuck in the 18th century with her sack back gown or francais gown in French, which was mostly popular before the 1770s. Uh, her possibly Italian gown uh, and these gowns with stomachers and elaborate trim. Even the lappet in her hair on the left harkens back to before Jane Austen was even born. The most modern she gets is the 1790s round gowns uh, with open robes. Anyway, the new Emma movie is far superior in costumery and just acting and, and plot in general, and I do recommend watching that one. And then we get to my secondary resources. Again, like I said, there are so many dress blogs, so many uh, customers to follow on various forms of social media, but I did spend a lot of time poring over a lot of these books. 
which do uh, very close studies. Many of them do very close studies of extant garments. So I use these books to make myself a less ignorant historical costumer. Uh, and they're all fantastic. All of these books are fantastic. Like I said, most of them have grid patterns you can scale up and use to make your own historical garments and or educate yourself on shapes and silhouettes of the past. And finally, I want to say a big thank you. Thank you so, so much to the Indiana Historical Costuming Society members who kindly modeled their creations for my presentation at Locust Grove and let me use their pictures in this uh, YouTube video. And for both this group and the St. Louis Historical Sewing Society for inspiring and encouraging me in my costuming adventures. I do friends.